Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you can see, we were very excited to have the India launch of our uh, report, the Global Commission report. It's the culmination of three years of hard work. But now on to the actual uh, panel. But uh, before I start that, if I could just mention that there are copies of the report available outside. So those of you who are interested, please do pick up a copy on your uh, way out. Uh, the subject of our uh, discussion today is Digital Crossroads, New Norms for a New Society. And I'd like to briefly introduce my fellow panelists, uh, starting on the far left, uh, or rather my far right, is Sandeep Malhotra. He's the Executive Vice President of MasterCard, based in Singapore, covering all of Asia. Uh, the ne next to him is Marina Kaljurand, the former Foreign Minister of Estonia, whom I think many of you heard speak today on European affairs. And uh, she is a member of the European Parliament and was originally the chair of our uh, Global Commission. And I had the honor to work with her as a co-chair. And uh, Carl Bildt, of course, an old friend and uh, the ex-Foreign uh, Prime Minister of Sweden. He was also the former Foreign Minister, by the way. Uh, and uh, he chaired the very first Global Commission uh, to be set up as a multi-stakeholder group, which was the Global Commission on Internet Governance, in which I was also a member. Uh, next to him is Chris Painter, uh, who was a commissioner on our Global Commission. He is now the head of the Global, uh, uh, global Forum on Cyber Expertise. Have I got that right? And uh, used to head the State Department uh, Cyber Department before he left the US government. And to my immediate right is Ambassador Henri Wardier, uh, the Ambassador for Digital Affairs of France, which he informs me covers a variety of issues, not just cybersecurity and cyber policies, but 5G, artificial intelligence, electoral systems, and he was formerly the Chief Technical Officer of France. So as you can see, we have a very distinguished panel uh, representing people from government, uh, policy makers, and uh, leaders of countries. Uh, uh, those with diplomatic experience, we have technical experts, we have an industry representative. So let's go straight into it. Uh, we have the I'd just like to say a few words to kick this off. Firstly, digital technologies, as we all know, are moving at greater speed than ever before and likely to become even faster with the introduction of uh, 5G, which seems to be very imminent. It's no respecter of nationalities or borders, these new technologies. And the digital community and policymakers are struggling to set rules, resolve conflicts, and keep digital space open, secure, and innovative. Unfortunately, the trust has been broken between the user and those who manufacture the devices, as well as policymakers. In a sense, the social compact which we envisaged as something which was going to evolve to allow us all to work together, in a sense, has not been uh, fulfilled. Domestic polarization has increased in many, many societies, including our own. And it has been accelerated thanks to unlimited social media. I think this is a problem that many of us are grappling with. And finally, the zero-sum international behavior that we see in cyberspace makes it very, very difficult to achieve any kind of international understanding. So, with that, I'm going to plunge into the first question, and I'll request each of the panelists in turn, starting with Ambassador Wattia, to uh, address them. The first question is, can we apply analog norms, or the norms of the analog world, to digital societies? Is it possible? If you could cover this and also highlight anything else you'd like to, and if I could, if each of you could keep your comments to about three minutes, and then we'll go into more questions. Ambassador? Thank you. So I think that we have to, and since we have to, we will, so we, we will, we can. 
if we cannot apply the ancient norms in the cyber world, we are not free citizens and we are not sovereign countries. So the free people has the right to decide the future and to organize a society. So seriously, we have to. And that's not easy, of course, and we have to be very careful. And I just want to mention three difficulties. First, we can say here, most policymakers don't understand about internet, don't understand how it works, don't understand that code is law, and that a lot of determination starts with technical decision. Very a long time before the policymakers uh, uh, start working. The second issue is that most laws or norms uh, are the result of a very subtle balance between contradictory principles. You, you want security and freedom and freedom of speech and uh, avoid uh, racism, uh, racist uh, speech, etc. And um, in my experience, and I work in this field for a long time, very often, when we try to launch a new regulation, a new norm, a new, we forget some of those principles. We focus on the issue, the main issue, and we forget the very subtle balance of those principles. And the last um, difficulty, is the last issue, is that we have to understand that we live in different times. The world has changed because of this uh, digital revolution, and we have to regulate within this digital revolution. I think very often about this. When I read the Declaration of the Right of the Citizen, Human Rights, it was written at a time where people didn't know to read, <laughs> people were not educated, we had no information, and we had no telecommunication. So when we write in France, for example, uh, two centuries ago, the citizen has the right to control every public servant, or the citizen contribute directly or through representative to the elaboration of the law. It's before information, it's before education, it's before telecommunication. Now we can make this. So we have to face the fact that it's different time and we need different strategies. But we have to, and because we have to, we will. <laughs> Thank you so much. Chris? Uh, so uh, I, you know, as I look at it, I think that, um, and, I, and before I was a cyber diplomat, our first cyber diplomat, I was a prosecutor. I've done a lot of law enforcement issues on cybercrime. And I've seen the evolution of the space over about 28 years where it was, you know, we weren't as dependent on the technologies and the threats weren't as great, and now we're facing a whole series of different threats. And, and I do think we have to apply, as Henri said, we have to apply norms in the physical world to the digital world. I think the danger of us trying to come up with an entirely different structure for cyberspace is cyberspace, although some people don't think it is, is grounded in the physical world. And we shouldn't have two sets of rules, whether you're online or offline. In fact, they should be, uh, they should be compatible. We've done this or tried to do this in the human rights area where we said that the same protections and responsibilities apply online as they did off do offline. That was a really important uh, conclusion that was reached now about four years ago, five years ago. How that's done, how that's implemented is still uh, some difficulty. We've said this, the UN has said this with respect to international law. The international law, the law uh, like the law of armed conflict, uh, human rights law, other law, applies in cyberspace just like it does in the physical world. Now again, how you apply international law is not easy and we have to figure out how that's done because there are some, some unique uh, aspects of cyberspace. And then when we talk about norms, and we'll talk about this more later, uh, we've had norms in the physical world. And, and the, I think the parallel there, as, we, as we've looked at this, is that norms then ripen into uh, to, uh, understandings, international law, uh, the ways that the countries deal with each other is the way that civil society and others deal with each other. So we've had the norms in the physical world. We need to have norms in the cyber world. And indeed, those are th things like norms of restraint. Countries shouldn't do things to each other. And that's we've been some agreements in the cyber world, like countries shouldn't attack the critical infrastructure of another or the uh, computer emergency response teams. And norms of cooperation. And so those are really important. And then the final thing I'll say at this point is that Norms are great in the real world, physical world, or the cyber world, but they're just words on paper if there's not accountability and, uh, and consequences for those who break the norms. We've seen this in the physical world when there are things like the uh, invasion of Crimea, and you, know, you need consequences to try to deter that uh, from happening in the future and that kind of activity. You need the same kind of consequences and accountability in the cyber world. I'd say we haven't been that good at that. We've been 
working on some norms, and our commission report talks about norms, so we might, we have to have accountability, and we have to have capacity for countries to deal with these issues. Thank you, Chris. Well, very difficult to find anything to disagree with uh, in what's been said. Um, but, um, of course, human rights law, laws of war and peace should apply in cyberspace as much as possible. But I say as much as possible, it reminds me of the story of Saudi Arabia once upon a time. Uh, they had the view that uh, the basis of all law was the Quran, and with a rather extensive interpretation of Quran, you can solve all problems. Uh, they run up, up at a problem when it was the, pro the distribution of radio frequencies at some point in time. So for a while, Saudi Arabia was governed by the Quran and the law for the distribution of radio frequencies because they couldn't derive that from the Quran. And I think we're going to be in roughly the same situation here. We're going to try to apply as much as we can from the ordinary physical analog world, but we do encounter things that can't be derived directly from that particular world. And just let me mention a couple of the issues that are complicated in our domestic political environments as well as on the global stage, and which we to some extent dealt with at least in the previous commissions and will be dealt with by future commissions as well. Issues of encryption are incredibly complicated and incredibly controversial, but absolutely critical for how we can deal with information security and privacy, be that the security of states or be that the privacy of individuals. Rules about data localization, which are applied very differently in different countries, have huge implications both for security and for stability of cyberspace. Privacy, I've already mentioned, uh, might be different views on that in, say, the European Union, the United States, and China. Uh, more similarities between the United States and Europe than certainly what we find in China. And that applies also to issues like surveillance, state surveillance, or private surveillance of different sorts. The security of the infrastructure. We have a vigorous debate on the security of the 5G infrastructure. What can we rely on? and what should we be careful with. But I would argue the security of the physical infrastructure of the fiber optic networks, the cables under the oceans, is absolutely critical. Because if that is disrupted, then everything goes haywire. And then setting the standards of different sorts, 5D standards or the sort of standards that are set in the Internet Engineering Task Force more or less on a daily basis that makes it possible for all of the systems to communicate with each other. And it's good if you operate on the same standards all over the world. And then, of course, the issues that the commission, this commission has dealt with, what are states allowed to do and what they shouldn't do in cyberspace, uh, where we, of course, see a development where technology now makes it possible for significant state actors to disrupt societies at a discrete distance and destroy economies at a discrete distance in a very short period of time. Nothing of this is allowed really under international law. But who is there to judge what's really going on? There is not peace in cyberspace. There's a constant war going on in cyberspace. And you can see hints of that now and then in the media when something goes haywire and someone is complaining. And then the number of actors out there that are planning active cyber operations, and that includes not only states, includes also private actors. I mean, if you look at the second page of the latest issue of The Economist, there's an ad for a cybersecurity company that says, well, we will now apply artificial intelligence to your cybersecurity needs. And our AI systems will immediately identify who is trying to do something nasty with you and strike back. Strike back. Are we going to have private AI systems striking back out there? Yeah, that's happening. So there's lots of things that needs profound thought and regulation. I, in the beginning of this conference, I said we should think back on the beginning of the industrial age 
and how the rules of the road were set for the industrial age. We are now setting the rules for the digital age, and that is going to be even more complicated because we are much closer to each other, much more interrelated, and uh, we are living in the world of algorithm and dependence and digital also exposure that requires very deep thoughts about these issues. Marina. Uh, thank you, Lata. Uh, very easy for me to agree with everybody what has been said before. So I'll try to bring maybe some, some, some new thoughts. Uh, as to the applicability of international law, I think that today there is no question. We all repeat like mantra, international law applies to cyber. We all agreed to that in the United Nations when we adopted the report of the group of governmental experts on cybersecurity, first in 2013, then in 2015, all members of General Assembly, everybody agreed. And the report says that international law applies to cyber, uh, naming specifically UN Charter in its entirety, also, me uh, also meaning Article 51, uh, inherent right of self-defense. So, full stop. But as soon as we come to the question, how exactly, it's not so easy. And I would say that we have not paid enough attention to the question, how exactly international law applies to cyber. And that is the reason we have so-called gray zones. That is the reason why we have ambiguity. And that is the reason why bad guys, meaning also bad states, are taking advantage of that. Look at what's happening in Ukraine. Ukraine is like a playground for everybody who wants to try how far then they, can they go in violation of international law. So, where do I see, where do I see, first of all, the problems. I have had the opportunity to be twice in the UN group of governmental experts on cybersecurity, so I have negotiated it. And last year, I had the honor to be on the uh, panel of the Secretary General on Digital Cooperation. And the biggest problem is the ideological division we have. And again, we have to be open and fear about that. When we all say, and we all say, free, open, accessible, secure, affordable internet, we all say. We all say we need multi-stakeholder model and inclusiveness in cyber, cyber security, cyber cooperation. But believe me, it's a different meaning if it's said by, I don't know, Estonian president, uh, Swedish prime minister, or president of China or Russia. So the ideological division is there. Like-minded countries on one side who see more the benefits of the use of ICTs and other countries who see more the challenges and they see the use of ICTs as interference into their domestic affairs. So I do not think that United Nations is able to solve that question in the near future. I see United Nations as a forum where we get together uh, uh, yeah, okay, I'm not going to say that. We get together, we listen to each other, we raise awareness, it has educational function. Will the United Nations be able to write a convention or new treaty on additional law, a law needed? No, no, no. In 20 years we get together and we are still at Article 1 definitions. Because, as I said, there is no ideological agreement, there is no political agreement among all member states of the United Nations how the, the cyberspace should look like, what are the questions of applicability, attribution, responsibility, state practice. So, I'll stop here, but I hope that later we'll come, uh, we can come to that. Thank you, Marina. Uh, I now turn to Sandeep. Sandeep, I know you have a onerous responsibility because you're representing private sector and industry and a big tech company on this panel. But we'd be interested to hear your views on this, you know? How do we develop new kind of standards, new kind of norms, new rules of the road from the point of view of industry? How do you see this evolving? Sure. So, <clears throat> so let, me, let me go back in terms of how we see digitization. So digitization, is happening everywhere. You know, if you look at platforms, if you look at network, if you look at services, they all get becoming dig digitized, and that's the the defining feature of the new economy. You know, how consumers buy, how businesses sell, it's all changing. You know, it's a new way of you know defining 
the shopping behavior, how you handle products, how you handle inventory, how you invent, handle logistics. It's all changing. And the world is becoming very interconnected. Even the consumers are changing the way they interact with each other. They interact with their families. They interact with their friends. They interact with their communities. And they combine that with these micro experiences around you know, how you interact with digital. And that paves the way for you know, a new experience altogether. And because it's changing and because everybody is connected and everything is getting connected, meaning your phone is getting connected, your PC is getting connected, your refrigerator is getting connected, your thermostat is getting connected, and they're all getting connected with each other. We sing this com concept of global interconnectedness. And this world of global interconnectedness is thereby different than this pure analog world, which was asset heavy. Digital is asset light. So while you could apply the same fundamentals of defining open, open standards, multilateral you know, rules, multilateral treaties and trade rules, it has to be treated differently where you basically need a collective action, which is just an imperative where multi-stakeholders get involved, define the standards, especially in new technologies like artificial intelligence, which is very open and is expected to have an impact on every sector you need to define the standards for this new technology before it goes you know, berserk and, and, and just out of control. So that's very, very important. And how do you do that? How do you do that is in a multi-stakeholder way, which actually is going to be hard, but will gain you international you know, alignment at some point of time. And then it's very important for the regulation not to basically mistrust or see what we see a trend, which is tech lash, a mistrust in technology or a seemingly, you know, uh, you basically see a perceived lack of control in technology. And we should see regulations created more around impact which the innovations bring, the business dynamic, dynamism and the innovation which, of the future which these, uh, which these uh, new technologies bring, uh, rather than these underlining lines of business because regulation around just payments, regulation around transportation, regulation around you know, particular line of business, it needs to go more horizontal. It needs to be more around the profound impact it has on the society and the economic growth. I think that is the most important thing which, uh, which is going to be different. But the principles of open standards, rules, remain more or less the same as the analog society. Thank you. Um, I'm going to actually combine two of my next questions because I want to leave enough time for the audience to interact with us. Uh, you know, it's what institutional changes do we need to transform our digital age? And what norms and architecture do we need to maintain st st safety, stability, and security of our interconnected world, basically? So what do each of you see as the changes? And again, I'll start with you, uh, Ambassador, if I may. I'll try to be brief, and as you can see, we can speak about cybersecurity and international law, or about everything, and, but everything is changing. The tax system, uh, content regulation, uh, education, uh, etc. To be brief, first, as I said, we are entering in a world where most people are educated, they have access to information, and they can interconnect themselves and work together. It changes everything about lawmaking and about public action. So I think that governments and maybe companies and maybe big tech companies has to learn uh, about multilateralism, a better multilateralism. That's an ancient idea, but in an interconnected world, it's more and more important. About multi-stakeholderism, and that's very important. Of course, in the digital field, we know about Internet Governance Forum. We know to speak together with companies, tech guys, civil society, government. And to understand an issue, we know how to make this in a multi-stakeholder approach. But to take decision, we have a lot of things to, to learn. Because companies are not people, because it's not one dollar, one vote, because um, we have the question of legitimacy. If you are a small NGO, can you speak in front of a government? Why? Where do you come from? So we, we have not finished to build a multi-stakeholder governance. It's, it's complicated. It's complicated. And we have probably to learn to deal with a kind of open gov approach. And I, because we don't have so much time, I just want to mention 
that we have a lot of new tools for public action. Transparency can be a very powerful tool uh, because um, after transparency, you have self-regulation, you have contribution, controversy, con you, you can discuss with the citizens, they can ask you, why do you do this? You can have suggestions. We can speak about infrastructures and commons. Uh, to protect one digital common can be very, very efficient, and it, it may be better than tons of regulation. You can empower citizens, so it's not about forbidden things, it's about allowing things to other people. You can organize a citizen contribution. You can think the government as a platform. So you have a huge variety of new strategies, and that's very important to, to inject those new strategies in the public action. So to conclude, I, I could you. continue, but I won't. Yes. <laughs> Chris, for you? Uh, well, I, I think there, there's a couple of things. One is inclusivity. So. Uh, yes, we talk about the multi-stakeholder system and having different stakeholders participate, but that has to be far more inclusive. It has to include countries around the world. Uh, it can't just be a small set of countries. It, you know, it does have to include private sector, civil society, and others together. Uh, they're going to have different strengths, and they're going to have different roles, depending on what the topic is, certainly. Uh, states always will have an important role in this, but I think building that ability for these other stakeholders to be part of these conversations is critically important, and that means that we have to really focus one of our real needs, and one of the things that, as, as uh, Lotha mentioned, I'm doing now, is trying to really advance the idea uh, around the world of better capacity building, more coordinated capacity building. This was a recommendation from our commission report as well that gets countries in Africa and Latin America and the ASEAN countries and others uh, really into these debates, because this is not just a debate among a few countries, it's a debate for everyone. Um, so that's one key role. Uh, and and that also includes making people aware of some of the decisions we've made so far and where we need to go. So you asked about structures. Uh, we have had, uh, and, and norms, we've made a fair amount of progress on norms. And these are non-binding norms. They're voluntary at this point. But we're also pretty early on in this discussion. The internet has not been around, frankly, that long. The discussion about stability has been around very much in a, a, a shorter term. Uh, but we have, even among countries in the, in the UN, come to some agreements about norms. Don't attack critical infrastructure in peacetime. Don't go after the certs, as I mentioned. Uh, cooperative norms. Our report has a number of other suggested norms about not attacking the public core of the internet, for instance, is one. Uh, do not go after election systems. A number of things that if countries actually abided by, we'd be much safer, we'd be much more stable uh, around the world. But. Uh, we need to work on that. That can't just be an agreement among a few countries or an agreement in the UN. We have to have countries really seizing on that, put, implementing those norms, putting them into their national strategies. Uh, and that's, I think, another area where we have to build uh, capacity, capacity for countries to have uh, national strategies, for them to have actual uh, institutions in place that deal with various aspects of cyber, for them actually to have the multi-stakeholder conversations with industry and others. Uh, that we've had in our commission and that some countries do very well and other countries, frankly, don't do it all. So we have to be able to do that, too. So there's a lot to do to lead us to the point where uh, we're actually having this conversation among all of us. Uh, and I, you know, I agree with many of Henri's comments. I think uh, there's a lot more to do here that we can do. This, it's not just a cyber issue anymore. Uh, I think if we just think of it as a cyber niche issue, we're going to lose. It has to be embedded into our national security, into our economic security, into our uh, human rights and diplomacy as well. Thank you. Carl? No, absolutely. I can't agree more with that. I mean, of course, go back to your question like that, of course, there might be institutional things that need to be done in our respective countries and on the global level, but that's not the main thing. The main thing, I would say, is awareness rising of the issues and their importance and trying to think ahead, difficult as that might be. Because the challenges that we face today, we might sort them out by tomorrow, but be then certain there's going to be another challenge coming tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. And, and also underline what was said, that there ain't any cyber issues any longer. There's a cyber effect on every other issue. We have sort of a digital tsunami of change sweeping through every single part of our society, more or less. I mean, just take two examples of the sort of recent debate in our respective countries. Currencies. I mean, one of the sort of really f foundations of states are that they issue money. They have central banks. 
the central banks love to control the money. <laughs> Good luck to them. Um, I don't think necessarily the Libra or Facebook is going to fly, but five, ten years from now, I'm not quite certain I would like to be a central banker, not that anyone would appoint me as one, uh, but anyhow, there's no question that payment systems and financial flows are going to be fundamentally changed by the digital technologies. Second issue, tax systems. We, we, we have a dispute at the moment between France and the United States on taxing of digital services in companies that they are supposed to sort out by next week, I understand. Good luck to them. But that's also the beginning of it. We have a dialogue in the OECD to try to sort these things out. In much the same way as our tax systems change fundamentally when we run from agricultural to industrial societies, our tax systems and all the interaction between them countries is going to change fairly fundamentally when we go from industrial to, to uh, digital societies. So you have to underline that, what was said. There ain't any cyber issues any longer. There is a cyber dimension that is increasing very fast on every other issue that we have on the agenda. Marina. I love this panel. I just can say I agree with everything and leave, but I will not. Yeah, but you normally say it more charming than we do. <laughs> uh, I think that we have a lot of norms. Uh, I'm a lawyer by education, so I understand very well the difference between legally binding norms of international law and political norms of responsible state behavior that are not legally binding. We have them. Now it's, start to, it's time to start implementing them. It's time to start saying who has violated those norms. It's the question of attribution, question of responsibility. Fortunately, in the recent years, we have seen some examples, some very first examples, and here I'm really proud of the EU. Look at the EU cybersecurity toolbox, an instrument of attribution, an instrument that has been used collectively by the EU. Why collectively? Because countries separately did not attribute. Mm. Estonia was attributing, Sweden was attributing, Germany, Italy, France, never. Because attribution in cybersecurity means saying that somebody's a bad guy. It means that there will be actions against you. It takes courage. It takes lots of political will. And that's why it's much easier to do collectively. Now we're doing it collectively. I want us to be more focused. I want us to be more determined. Second, I'm a strong believer in inclusiveness and multi-stakeholder, listening to private sector and cooperating with private sector. I come from Estonia, yeah? And thanks to 2007 cyber incidents against my country, we have the practice of cooperating with private sector. The IT geeks, the ones with ponytails governments can never afford, came voluntarily to cooperate with government. And since then, we're cooperating. And we have seen in practice that governments alone can't deal with cybersecurity. Governments have to change their thinking. They have to, they have to break their DNA and start looking differently at private sector, trusting private sector, cooperating with private sector. Um, and my final point, uh, we should not forget our citizens and our people. Because all the digital, it's influencing our people. Again, I come, up, come from a country where 99% of services are online. There are just a couple of, as we call them, high-risk um, uh, high transactions that you have to do in a physical world. Getting married, getting divorced, and some property deals. Everything else you can do online. But, but in order for people to take advantage of that, you should educate them, and you should break stereotypes. So at the same time, we, ha we have cyber on the agenda for kids starting from first grade. My mother is 95, she's Skyping. We have to break the stereotypes that cyber is only for, I don't know, middle-aged, rich, well-educated males. It's for everybody. It's for me. I'm a grandmother. So we should start uh, talking more to our people and preparing our people that that's the future. It's not going to disappear. Cyber is part of our life. Cyber attacks is a new normality. And we have to live with that. The sooner we understand, the better for us and our people. Sandeep, uh, I'm going to actually change the focus a little for you to bring in the question I meant to ask at the end, but since we're running out of time, I'm going to ask you about the role of private sector and industry in policy making. What do you make of that? Yeah. 
I think, I think that is a very important role. And, and I, we still, I still would stay with this norm of uh, global interconnectedness is the norm. I think if we achieve with this objective of what we want to achieve as a society which drives economic growth and, uh, and basically improves the quality of life of people, I think it's called global interconnectedness. And what, I, what do I mean by that? I mean, I work for MasterCard, which is a global technology company, and we are a network. We basically drive global interconnectedness through frictionless commerce. We connect billions of consumers, millions of merchants, thousands of financial institutions in a fashion which is very secure and totally frictionless and seamless. And in order to do that, we basically are seeing regulations which are you know, again, because of mistrust in technology uh, around governing cross-border da cross data flows. And what that does is it fragments the global interconnectedness. It slows down the economy. It basically, we've seen through research, you know, there's this new research from, from, uh, from uh, United Nations. Uh, this is a digital economy report, actually. We just came out of, uh, from United Nations uh, uh, Conference on Trade and Development, which basically says, close to, if you restrict data flows, close to 0.7 to 1.7% of the GDP of a country gets impacted in countries like India, Indonesia, Brazil. And if you take, go to markets like China, it gets impacted by 3.4%. So how do we make sure that we work with the regulators, we work with the public bodies, where we bring in our technology expertise and innovation, which doesn't have borders, which helps you like in simple words, you know, in simple examples like fraud prevention, Fraud prevention is, it doesn't have any borders. You need to have multi-country data sets. Fraud will happen in one country and will propagate to another country in milliseconds. And these localized you know, data rules are not gonna help it. So how do we make sure that we work, work with the regulators to make sure that while we respect the data protection, consumer privacy, and still achieve the benefits of cross-border data flows? I think that's where we see a, a big edge and collaboration working between public bodies and the private sector. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to open it up for questions now. And I'd like to start with questions from the Raisina Young Leaders. Um, and uh, I see two of them at the mic. May I start with you, ma'am, and then on to you, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Beth Goldberg, and I'm from the United States. Uh, I work in the tech industry, and uh, there's one type of cyber attack that I focus on a lot that's been neglected by this report that I'd like to ask you about, um, and that's psychological operations campaigns or disinformation campaigns. Last year, I had the opportunity to visit eastern Ukraine, where I met with teams of men and women who made their living disseminating disinformation in the form of posts, uh, posts and tweets and articles every day. And I think this growing industry of online propaganda from state and non-state actors is a cybersecurity challenge because their goal is to destabilize democracies and to manipulate political outcomes. So I'm not going to ask the panel how we eliminate propaganda. I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but I would like to ask you how we might, as an international community, better establish norms to mitigate against what I see as military-grade psychological operations campaigns. Thank you. Thank you. Who would like to take that? I, I can, okay, if you want to. Okay, well, Henri, maybe you you're have, the first off the mark. Maybe we have different things to share. First, in France and most like-minded country, we try to separate cyber attacks on infrastructures and content information, opinion manipulation, which is another threat. But from our perspective, we need different uh, set of laws because on one side, you speak about infrastructures, on war, on uh, tech engineers, on the other side. You need to think about freedom of speech, freedom of press, uh, freedom of democracy, etc. It's a bit different. Some people know to use both, and you have to be able to resist to an attack using both, an hybrid uh, threat. But we try to, to clearly think that it's different. Some countries have different strategies. Um, how can we face this? Uh, when I say that we need new tools, new approach, more open, etc., you can decide to forbid uh, fake news and to encourage the through. It's very dangerous. It's Big Brother at the end of the day. It's a state deciding where is the truth, etc. 
So for example, in France and a lot of other countries, we have a program to empower the democracy, to share what we see, to work with re public research, with media, with citizens, to, 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 to try to, yes, to, to give more resistance to the democracy itself. And government alone cannot protect the citizen from this without being very dangerous for the democracy itself. But if I can share a last idea, one, uh, one day we'll have to face the business model of the social network. How can they promote the sensationalism, the fake, the hate, the most amazing, the most impressive, the most stupid things like this? If I can share an information coming from the Center for Human Technology in San Francisco, if you go on YouTube and you ask for Mueller investigation, 15% of the, the answers will be one video from Russia today. Why do we have, do you, American citizen, have this video as a pertinent information about this question? And I think that we will need to, to discuss about transparency, about this algorithm, about this curation, about how this content are promoted. And maybe that's most important than speaking about true or, or fake. If I can just mention, you know, you did mention the report, the lady yeah. who asked the question. Uh, the report has very clearly said it's going to talk about cyber stability. And we deliberately stayed away from the question of yeah. content and misinformation. Because we believe that there is scope to do another report on that, mm -hmm. and I'm sure there are many efforts already underway, yeah. but it was outside the scope of our mandate. Our mm -hmm. mandate was to really recommend norms which would enhance cyber stability. Mm -hmm. and, and, just, and just picking Chris? up on that, there, there, are, there is a lot of work in that area, and Lot is right. Uh, there wasn't a lot of work in what we were doing, and so we thought that that was an important niche. Uh, one of those things is something uh, that I, I was part of at Stanford, where a number of people came together and came up with a report about disinformation campaigns, cyber-enabled disinformation campaigns, things we need to do, including deterrence and norms. There are norms in this space as well. Uh, I think one of the problems we face, though, well, I was in uh, the government when uh, the elections happened in 2016. Uh, we didn't see that coming. We didn't see the Russian interference coming because the cyber people were focused on cyber. And this is really a hybrid issue. And so you have to have the cyber people involved. But you also have to have the people who deal with disinformation campaigns. It's a very different tool set, as Henri said, to re respond to this. If anyone else wants to comment on this, or we could go straight into the next question, if you feel it's done. Please, go ahead, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm John Herring, also from the United States. And thank you for this uh, wonderful panel discussion, um, as well as for the really impressive and very uh, additive report. Um, I guess my question is, we've heard a lot from this discussion about uh, the importance of capacity building and cybersecurity awareness raising, uh, which can't be overstated and is critically important. Um, but you're still left with the other side of the equation when it comes to norms implementation, which is bad actors who are simply unwilling uh, to act responsibly and comply with these standards. And I think I've yet to hear, and, and Ms. Caldron started to walk down this path discussing attributions and, and some of the more deterrent-based uh, efforts, but I've yet to hear a consistent theory of change uh, about how we start turning the tide on escalating numbers of cyber attacks each year. Uh, what will it take to sort of, beyond particular norms uh, here and there, and a declaration from the UN, uh, what, what's going to start turning the ship around such that we uh, stop seeing these escalating numbers of attacks? Marina? Uh, yes, thank you for the question. And Chris. Uh, I don't think that there is difference between online and offline worlds. So what we need, we need to bring those to responsibility. We've done, we've done some small things, maybe too late, too little, when well, President Obama's administration expelled some diplomats. We have, we have taken some measures. EU made its first attribution. I'm really looking forward to EU start applying the toolbox and introducing sanctions against concrete persons. So I think that the same uh, tools that we have in the offline world should also apply to online world. And if rules, uh, if international law is violated, then there can't be excuses. So as I said, I'm, uh, stay tuned. As much as I know, EU pretty soon will take the first, uh, will make a first introduction of sanctions to those who are behind cyber attacks. Thank you. Carl? I hope that will happen and I hope it will have an effect. But let me add, bad actors will always be there. And some bad actors are difficult to deal with. I mean, the, 
to take one distinctly bad actor, so the, the, the North Koreans. What do you do with them? You can strike back cyber against them, but if, uh, they don't have that much strike, cyber to strike at. Uh, can you expel North Koreans? That's probably already done. Uh, for other reasons, can we have sanctions for them? We already have sanctions and everything. Uh, they continue to steal money all over the world with cyber operations. So we must build up defenses, sort of cyber defense, cyber again, so we're all aware of the vulnerabilities and block things, daily basis, all of us, and awareness of the fact that the bad actors are there. And uh, much in the same way as in the normal world, there are bad actors. We can have live with bad ad actors in the, in the digital world, but we need to limit it as much as possible. But we won't eliminate it. Yeah, but, Chris? Uh, so I, I, I totally agree with that. And you know, the way I used to say it when I was a prosecutor is that you, you have to lock your doors and bolt your windows. Uh, that's important, important. But if someone breaks in, there has to be consequences for those actors. And we are terrible. We suck at, at imposing consequences on state actors in particular. We've gotten a little better in the criminal actors. We still have a long, long way to go there. But we are just awful at this. And, and consistently, yes, we've done some things in response to the election interference, not strong enough, not consistent messaging. We need both collective response and we need a strategy for this. And we need to be consistent. We need to speak consistently. And I think we, you know, I, I, if I look at the sanctions and other things that have been done, yes, we need to use all our tools and include sanctions and include diplomatic tools that include even p potentially cyber tools. Uh, that include other kinds of economic tools, the whole range of things. And we need to think of new tools, too, that we, we, can, we can use and maybe work with the private sector on some of these issues. So, uh, but, but I've been really uh, worried about this because although we've gotten better, and I agree, Marina, we've gotten better at what we call collective attribution. So there's been, for a number of the big cyber attacks over the last couple of years, a number of countries that came together and there was a big, what they called the Notpedia worm that caused uh, Maersk, the big shipping giant, to have problems and caused untold amounts of damage around the world, uh, monetary damage. B a group of countries came together, including the U.S., and said it's Russia, uh, North Korea, and another big one. Great, great that we're calling them out. But you know, those countries can't really be named and shamed, so you have to take further action on them, and we have not done that consistently. Uh, and that's really, uh, that's true in the physical world, and it's true in the cyber world. And, and the one thing I'd say that, that we need to do is to mainstream this issue so it's not just the cyber issue that we discuss in panels like this, but that leaders around the world understand this. When this, the poisoning happened in, uh, in England, uh, within one week, Theresa May said it was Russia. Within two weeks, she had comprehensive, uh, a collective group of nations imposing sanctions. When a big cyber event happened, the Notpedia worm, six and a half months later, the group came together and said it's Russia. And then when they made that announcement, they said, and there will be consequences sometime later on. That's not the message we can send. We have to be much stronger. Thank you. Uh, I want to open up the floor to uh, two more questions from the floor. Yes, I have a lady there. I have a gentleman here. Hello, everybody. My name is Oshirin Armanait. I'm a member of parliament from Lithuania. I have a broader question regarding um, legal regulation. I sort of have noticed that um, policymakers uh, have a temptation to regulate new economy phenomena according to old economy rules. For instance, Uber. In some countries, it's illegal because politicians, decision makers, want to regulate it just as uh, traditional tax taxi services. Then financial services financial technology. We can't regulate fintech companies just as traditional banking, even though there are numerous attempts to do that. Then social media versus traditional media, again. And there are many more examples. So don't you think that jurisprudence that we have inherited from the 20th century or even 19th century can't actually assure growth and going forward, even though policy makers, decision makers, are, well, attempting to apply it on and on and on. Sorry. What's your I, take I'm on sorry. that? I'm going to, to you. cut you short. We're yes, really yes, that's the question. Thank you. Yeah. Who would like to respond? What? Why you ask the okay. Why don't we get the second question, and then we'll, okay. I'll get everyone to address them in their final comments. Okay. Um, my question actually is for honorable member of European Parliament. I'm a law student. And my question to you, ma'am, is 
Just like we have universal declaration of human rights, do you see something like that happening for cyberspace and of course for our individual data? And will EU take leadership on this critical issue? Thank you. Uh, what I suggest is we have about a minute left, so I'll need a very quick 20 second summing up from each of you addressing the last two questions and telling me what do you see as the priority for us to create these new norms for a new society. Marina, I'll start with you since the last question was addressed to you. Uh, yes, thank you. I can be very brief with that. I think that the EU has made it very clear human rights online are equal to human rights offline. So EU has made it clear and the majority of states have stated that. So we do not need special human rights declarations for cyber because the same human rights declarations and laws that we have in the uh, offline world apply to online world. And the question on Uber, uh, Estonia was among the first countries to legalize Uber, so we gave Uber the same rights as taxi. Uh, we were looking into the matter, should we have a specific law on artificial intelligence? And we decided that's not, not the way. We even discussed, should artificial intelligence be a new uh, legal, legal, legal personality? We decided no. So we have to regulate the relationship between artificial intelligence and humans. So it has to be human-centered, and our way in Estonia has been to add appropriate sections to the existing laws that regulate artificial intelligence in those specific fields. Thank you. Uh, Sandeep, you next. I'll give you, I can't comment on the, the, the legal uh, thing, but I, I, I still think, I think the most important thing is collecting, collective, collective action is imperative. The whole multi-stakeholder participation is just imperative. Data remains, you know, one of the single most important tool in driving future growth, even though it creates a lot of turbulence, but I think it is the most important tool. And third is, I think, the, we need to work with regulators around the world to achieve flexibility that's built around impact, that's built around <laughs> innovation, so that products of the future are, are providing, you know, goodness to the society. Thank you, Sandeep. Carl? Yeah, yeah, so that question from Lithuania very tricky because a lot of the digital changes are happening challenging established sectors where there is old regulation. And that means that the vested interests there, which are suddenly subject to devastating competition, try to use old regulations to block it. Uh, but lately there have been some landmark rulings by the European Court of Justice, which has been important. How, how you define Airbnb, how do you find Uber, how do you find Booking.com, and that sort of decides whether it's subject to old regulations or you should look at it with new eyes. And the European jurisprudence is now working towards seeing it as a new things and don't applying old regulations. But be certain, there are vested interests that are going to fight this until the last kilobyte or whatever. Thank you. Chris? Uh, since uh, I, I think the two questions have been answered by, and I agree with those answers from others on the panel, uh, I would just go to the, the two things that I, I think are important. One of many. Uh, one is, as I said, accountability for nation states and non-nation states for bad acts in cyberspace. That's not just about consequences, that's also calling out that activity and defining uh, what damage it's being caused. There's a number of people around uh, the world are starting to focus on that, and that's really important. And the other, as I said before, is, is capacity building, coordinated capacity building, which allows the collective action we need in this space that will also raise the awareness level to a political level, and we need to do that. Uh, hopefully, the, you know, among other things, the Global Forum for Cyber Expertise can do that, but it's beyond that. We really get to, have to get to senior decision makers. Ambassador. Thank you. About the Uber question, I just want to share the more you put details on the law, the more you specific, technology specific you are, the more you will have issues. And I just want to share this with you. The treaty organizing the Suez Channel was seven pages long. It was a very small treaty. The contract for Eurotunnel between France and UK was 7,000 pages long. <laughs> and six months after, all the sh shareholder was ruined because it was uh, broken. So if we try to say this is a car, this is a in artificial intelligence, this is a blah, blah, we will have a lot of issues. If we go to principle, freedom of speech, human rights, 
etc. Uh, after you have the you know the GDPR. The GDPR is about citizen consent about the use of their personal data. It's simple. We need the consent of the citizen if he uses his data. The principle can be simple. About your question, the more I work on this field, the more I think that we need to empower or re-empower the democracy. Democracy as collective intelligence and collective decision about general interest and about protecting the, more, the, the most people. And we have to, to build something new to protect and to promote democracy. Thank you so much. I think you'll agree with me that we've had an outstanding uh, panel. You can see why it's been a joy and a delight for me personally to interact with so many of you over the last uh, eight years since I started working on this fascinating uh, subject. And I think we've, it, this is a dialogue that has to continue. We need multi-stakeholder dialogues. We need to think about implementation. We need to think about consequences. We need to think about uh, many aspects, you know. And I think that while the temptation to put everything together is there, I think it's better to actually separate the issues and deal with each one separately. Uh, that is really the conclusion I'm coming to after listening to, to all of you. Uh, we can't be all things to all people. They have to be specific, specific groups addressing specific concerns in, when it comes to cyber. And as you say, it's much more than cyber. When we use digital, it now covers a whole new world of advancing technologies and uh, technologies that are frankly going to transform our, uh, our lives and already have. So with that, I'll request you to give the panel a, a round of applause and we will get off the stage.